Okay, this is the question and answer time, and I, I know that people have some questions. I think maybe it would be good if all three of our speakers came up and they don't have to sit on these stools, but maybe come up and stand in front for our stand or and or sit. And um, I will be glad to get the ball rolling with a question from Joyce. Hold it for just a second, please. Okay. Make sure, let me make sure I get this right before we, let's get everybody positioned if you don't mind. Okay. Okay, can you help me with that? Yeah, I think, Tell me um, what to do. if everyone will kind of stay by tool. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Where we are right now? No. Oh, yeah. Okay. You're great. You're great. Okay. Go. Now you may relax. You're all very photogenic. Oh, good. Can we relax and sit down? You all right. can sit. Um, I'll just start with a question from Joyce. You all are aware, and I, and I know the speakers are aware, that we have people going on this trip to Russia with uh, Martha that are not here in Greensboro. And some of them have been connected um, by distance learning network with us for this presentation. And we've asked them if they would like to ask a question, they need to tell it to Martha first, and then I would read it at this time in the program. So Joyce asks, when I was in Kazakhstan, the first year it became a republic. There seemed to be a great deal of, quote, spiritus, belief in fortune telling, energy balls, etc. Would this be true of Russia too? If so, is it still an alternative to the organized religions such as Orthodox Christianity? And you may all take a crack at it, but maybe Father Christopher would like to try Well, I, I'm not an authority on, on that, but I do know when I've, I've been to Russia, uh, particularly right after the fall of communism, there was just this flowering of looking into all kinds of stuff. I know when I was there, people were fascinated with UFOs, uh, looking into kind of, you know, paranormal activity. Um, so I imagine that in conjunction with, um, you know, the fortune telling and all of that, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm willing to guess that it, there is a lot of that there. Sounds like New Mexico to me. <laughs> Well, there is a, a concept called the voyevieria, which is sort of, you know, it, it's a, a melange of uh, old pagan traditions mixed in with uh, uh, some uh, more uh, Christian traditions. And uh, I've always had the impression that Russians sort of have a uh, uh, kind of an a la carte menu, that uh, there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. You know, for the longest time, people had house spirits, you know, the damovuya. And uh, uh, you know, Rusalki, these mermaids, uh, you know, who were living in the, the uh, brooks and rivers, who would jump out and kill men and uh, drown them. Uh, so I, I think that uh, that's that's all part of it. And uh, you know, the fortune telling and the guy on TV. I remember back in the '90s. I, I think it's all part of this sort of yeah, we are Christian, but at the same time, you know, we like uh, our old pagan beliefs. Mm -hmm. Although I come right out and see it. I have another question from Joyce. Do you have any information on the Russian underground quote, such as Mikhail Bulgakov's quote, master, the master and master Margarita? Margarita? Bulgakov, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the Russian underground? Yes, on the Russian underground. Uh, I wouldn't call it the underground. I mean, certainly he, uh, he had a lot of serious problems. He was an extremely popular playwright in the 1920s wrote a number of very interesting short novels. The Master and Margarita was actually unfinished when he died in 1940 and was discovered by researchers in 1966, I believe. But Bulgakov has since become virtually an industry. Uh, and everywhere you go, I mean, you know, just, it's not just a matter of academics now. I mean, you have, uh, his, his house is a museum. Uh, there are cafes, you know, uh, you know, named after characters in his, uh, uh, his works. Uh, but he is an extremely big deal. And uh, Master Margarita, I recommend everybody read because the devil comes to Moscow uh, with uh, unpleasant and very often funny uh, consequences. Okay, questions from the floor here now. Yes, Fred? Uh, during the uh, Soviet era, <clears throat> the statuary and sculpture was very sort of severe. Uh, with uh, hard-working people, very sharp and so forth. Has that changed since uh, 
89 have they become sort of more soft, if I can use that, in the way they do sculpture now? Do I need to repeat the question for the people online? Oh, you didn't hear it? Yeah, okay. What, what was asked was the uh, sculptures and things um, after the Cold War were very um, businesslike and sharp, and Fred wonders if that has changed with the ceasing of the Cold War, if it has. Yeah. I can I can speak to that. Um, yeah, I mean one of the one of the quandaries that uh, public officials faced when the monuments of Stalin came down was, well, what goes up instead? So uh, the major cities actually all have uh, sort of um, sculptors, monumental sculptors on the payroll, and. The sculptings that have been erected in Moscow and St. Petersburg and around the country tend to be much more kind of fanciful. For example, there's uh, a sculptor who's sort of the court sculptor of, of Putin. <laughs> You'll see his sculptures all around Moscow. Sorry. Ah. And um, he, he created this sort of infantilizing um, mythological program near the zoo in Moscow because there's there was the the idea behind it was that you know we're starting from scratch we're all infants again we have to reinvent ourselves we have to grow into ourselves so there's also a lot of sort of fanciful historical figure figures being represented so yeah it's quite a different sculptural landscape these days. Do, do they have a, uh, a place in Moscow or in Petersburg where all of the old statuary has been dragged off? I know yes. they do in Budapest. Yes. They call it Statue Park. Yes. Well, the, the Moscow version of that is called the, the Park of Fallen Heroes, <laughs> which is a little problematic because, you know, Dzerzhinsky, the head of the KGB, and Stalin and Brezhnev are all there. Um, so it depends on who's, you know, uh, whose story is being told as to whether they're heroes <laughs> or villains. Yeah. Yeah. But they're all in a, one place. They're all, well, many of them are in one place, yes. Any other questions? Yes. Well, Danny? For Father Foley, he means in vodka. Uh, is <laughs> there a, uh, I know London doesn't drink it all, and I drink very little. But, uh, <laughs> so is there a polite way, or will I be an issue, much of an issue if you, uh, have to frequently decline their offers of vodka. <laughs> the, the funny thing is, you know you're not at a Baptist seminary when part of our pastoral theology classes was how to hold your liquor during house blessing season. <laughs> um, one thing I was told, and you know, I haven't tested this necessarily, but uh, if you're given a shot, that if you don't let that go empty, they won't refill it. So if, you know, there's a way you can just, you know, kind of sip on that shot a little bit. Um, but if you empty it, they're going to refill it. And they're very convincing, you know, like, oh, you've got to have more, you know. But they'll make you drink it. <laughs> they will. I, I would say that two things that you might do. <laughs> things that you might do are, uh, first of all, keep in mind that Russians usually uh, have food along mm -hmm. with their drink to help out. And also, it is not uncommon, I've seen this done where, you know, very often you drink a, like, a large glass of water so that you don't dehydrate. Russians very often will have a large glass of uh, room temperature water, put some jam in it, stir it around, and drink it, and they're fine for the rest of the evening. And then you just balance it with food, and you know it, it doesn't hurt to uh, you know not not drink everything yeah. uh, too quickly. Another question. My friends made me drink. Yes. <laughs> they are convincing. Uh, the painter is uh, Venetianov. Venetianov. Yeah. Okay. And you showed us. Um, the woman who was nursing the child, and right. she's very attractively dressed for being a... A serf. A right. serf, and a very idyllic setting mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, I noticed the sickle on the ground mm -hmm. behind her. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and you had the date was 1820. Was that painted in 1820? Yes. Okay, yes. so 
I, I see the second <coughs> component right. uh, very early on. Right. Um, several of my colleagues, uh, including myself, uh, had the opportunity to go to the Real Russia program that UNCG has in its emeritus series, and we watched a number of Russian films, mm -hmm. so I'm becoming tuned into watching for what I saw there in that is what would be portrayed as Mother Russia. Yes. And uh, the Absolutely. other thing is, uh, for geography purposes, for my head, help me with this, where exactly using today's uh, political boundaries was Prussia? Prussia was the, the forebear to the German Empire. Okay, yeah. thank you. So um, roughly, um, roughly, uh, roughly shared borders with okay. the German Empire. Okay, yeah. I have some other questions, but I'll let somebody else ask one now. Right. <laughs> See the microphone. Who else? Another question? He silenced everybody. <laughs> what? That way you ask the next one. Okay. Uh, for Father Foley, um, I think you may have answered this question. What was the time period when um, Cyril wrote the alphabet, like almost 1,000 or something like that? Well, no, it was before 980. I think it was uh, like 7th, early 8th century, if I recall. Mm -hmm. um, and, right. it, it, and it wasn't into Russia. It was in what is modern-day Bulgaria okay. is where they first went. The thing that I found <clears throat> was most interesting in, in your describing that a missionary helped them sort of get their alphabet together is last year when we were in um, uh, Vietnam, mm -hmm. uh, their alphabet was also created by a missionary, or either that or oh, Thailand. Right. No, in Thailand. Huh. Uh, I don't know. They, they, uh, a missionary also created that. Um, and thanks to um, Martha, I am reading Russian literature for the Very first good. time in my life. Oh my gosh. Uh, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm about two thirds of the way through Tolstoy's uh, War and Peace. Good. And um, one of the things that I found was, as you were describing, sometimes he's writing things in great detail, more so than I would really care to know about <laughs> things. Um, but at the same time, the thing that I found most fascinating was, and this covers the time period of like 1805 to 1815 or something mm -hmm. like that, just for the benefit of everybody else, um, how uh, much in love with the French, the Russian, where oh, yeah. they would send all their kids to mm -hmm. France for education purposes, and of course, and I could see where Catherine would have just been happy about capturing all of the Russian painters' works and hanging them uh, there, but what is the love affair hmm. that Russia had with French and the French language and, and, and so forth. I'm interested in knowing your take on that, that just that entity of how that is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I, I think first of all, um, uh, wealthy Russians, members of the aristocracy, the nobility wanted their children to be citizens of the world. And so they were given instruction in English, German, French. But the deal with France was, I think France was at that time viewed as the epitome of world culture. It was the most sublime, the most exciting. Uh, French was at that time the language of uh, um, uh, diplomacy, I suppose. It was like the lingua franca, you know, I, I believe if I'm not mistaken. But uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, French was so important. In fact, in uh, War and Peace, the first page, page and a half, originally was written in French. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, there are different editions uh, where it might have been redacted somewhat. But uh, it, you were understood to, uh, to speak French if you wanted to be looked upon as a cultured person. I mean, if you met somebody from Germany, you spoke French if you didn't speak German. But everybody who wanted to aspire uh, to, uh, to that uh, level of uh, uh, culture or education uh, learned French. In Pushkin's uh, Yevgeny Onegin, the uh, novel in verse, uh, the, hero, uh, the heroine of the story, Tatiana, uh, uh, she and her family, they, uh, they speak French better than their Russian. Uh, and it is true to an extent. Uh, Pushkin himself grew up reading his father's French library. 
So it was, it was very much uh, de rigueur. You know, it's what you did if you were a somebody, I would say. Plus, then, you know, French food. <laughs> right. And then there's the flip side, which is that during moments of cultural isolationism, for example, under Nicholas II and his father was Alexander III, when Russia was officially turning away from those, the contacts with French, um, artists were persecuted for being too French. So many of the modern artists uh, who were trying to emulate Vincent van Gogh and Paul Cezanne in art school were actually kicked out of art school because of their sort of pandering to French, the French model. So France is definitely a kind of, you know, there's a love-hate relationship with, with that, that culture. Well, Absolutely. I'd say in the 18th century, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you had the, the whole, uh, uh, what do they call it, the Enlightenment. And you had the mm -hmm. French philosophers. Catherine the Great, uh, you know, conducted personal correspondence with some of the great uh, French thinkers of the time. She herself, by the way, was German, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. You know? But very, very intelligent. Uh, and I think there was just some sort of sense that the French yeah, they know what, they know what's what. Well, they do. <laughs> May we? Well, and after the revolution, many of the intellectuals in Russia fled to Paris. You know, a lot of the philosophers, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, today, if you were to talk to the thought leaders, cultural leaders in uh, Russia, who would they uh, look at? as the, uh, somewhere where they could gain some value, China, US, uh, France still, or where? Do you have any feeling of the average leader where they might think of picking cultural tips from? I think that's a sign of weakness. Sign of weakness to uh, <laughs> acknowledge anybody. <laughs> no, no. In fact, you know, for the longest time, the Russians said that they invented television and they invented everything else. They used to have a VDNK, mm -hmm. okay, the, uh, the exhibition of the achievement of the Soviet peoples or the national peoples, and they had something in there where they had invented television and yeah. various other things. Um, the Russians have historically a large inferiority complex, and I think part of what's happening right now in Russia is an attempt uh, to, uh, to, to basically bury, bury that uh, once and for all. Uh, I'm not sure that the uh, Russians nowadays, at least the leaders of Russia and, and you know, popular opinion of Russia, I'm not sure that they really look to other countries except as, uh, you know, occasionally, the, you know, French fashions, you know, Italian cars, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, but uh, basically, I think the Russians are very content with who they are and sort of uh, don't see that much need. I, I think, how do you feel? Yeah, I mean, the same, the same can be true about the world of the visual arts, um, although the Russians, the contemporary artists working today are, are still very enamored with the American commercialization of art. And so many participate, many Russian artists participate in the American art market and the European art market because that they feel like that's where they're being accepted, that's where they're understood. So even though, as Court was saying, there's a sense of contentment about just being Russian, um, there's this allure of the West that is also very present. It's also yeah. this, мы хотим мир, весь мир, okay? And translation is, you know, the word мир means the world, it also means peace. And they used to, you know, the joke used to be, we want the world, the whole world, you know, with the pun <laughs> on the word peace. And I think maybe the Russians, you know, they, uh, they want to be the people who are going to be in a position to control where a lot of this, well, this cultural product goes. Sure. I mean, it's a measure of success. But, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. What's your take on the current political situation in Russia? The question is, what's your, t I'm sorry, Judy. Go ahead, finish. The question is, what's your take on the current political situation in Russia? Uh, it's, it's not good. It's not good. Yeah. It's, uh, it's become a gangster state. Yeah, I mean, uh, Putin has really changed over the course of his 
uh, si since he came to power as prime minister during the Yeltsin era. And it's just been so interesting to watch him become, you know, go from a rather modest, um, soft-spoken, and very pragmatic leader to a leader who is, um, who has become a kind of buffoon on the world stage, but at home is, is a thug, is um, oppressive, and everyone I know in Russia is, is, is terrified of, you know, what's going to happen next? Is my university going to shut down? Is, you know, am I going to be kicked out of my government job because I have the wrong politics? People are very, I mean, artists are all just saying, let's keep our mouth shut for now. So there's a real sense of fear, I think. It's like the 1930s all over again. Like in, in, my, in my parish, I have Russians and Ukrainians. Yeah. And there are some very difficult conversations that happen kind of during coffee hour after church. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, not only is Ukraine becoming nationalistic, some Russians are becoming very nationalistic and, you know, these are driving wedges, you know, in communities here, definitely communities over there, um, depending on where you are in the Ukraine. Um, you know, so it, it is, it's very. If I could just add to that, <clears throat> the point that was made previously about should, about should when, when Putin is thinking, uh, should we look west or should we look inward? Mm -hmm. I, I think that what you're describing is actually this inward look mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to be able to, we can get along without the west, we don't right. need the west and stay out of our lives. Mm -hmm. And as I'm reading more and more Russian literature, I feel I'm better able to understand Vladimir Putin, mm -hmm. why he is the way he is. Mm -hmm. I don't think he can help it because if he is in his mind, in his heart, if he is a Russian, he wants to keep out everybody else. I mean, and don't mess with us. He's a very powerful person, mm -hmm. too, and I don't think we should underestimate him. Right. Yeah, so I agree. What's the implication for those who are traveling there and the conversations they might have with their own folks? What's the implication for those of question. us traveling there and with conversations that we might have with our hosts or and people we encounter? Mm -hmm. or not. Well, it's certainly not the Soviet era when you know that all your conversations are being bugged. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> um, but you know, I think um, I think that it's it's actually a fantastic time for everybody to be going because it's just really there's just so much to talk about, and it's there are going to be so many points of view expressed. You know, there's not one single monolithic experience of living in Russia, and you're going to have the opportunity to just hear so many opinions about what's going on. I think it's fantastic. And, you know, there's the economic piece, there's the political piece, and, the, and I think that there's, um, it's, it's really an exciting time. And I understand if people are nervous, but Russia's always been just a little too interesting, <laughs> right? Which is why we're attracted to it, yeah. right? So now it's too interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, I think it's important to, uh, to note, I would say this, that uh, most of the Russians I've met, uh, and I get this impression over the last, uh, definitely over the last two decades, the Russians are curious about the rest of the world, mm -hmm. they're curious about life. I mean, there are opportunities to travel now that they never had before. Um, and uh, it seems to me that uh, you know, when, when you say that, well, Putin is a Russian, and this is, you know, why he wants to keep Russia Russian. I, I'm not sure how much that uh, uh, that trickles down to the the average individual, but it's it's a little scary because of his control of media, because of mm -hmm. uh, these these attacks on on journalists or other political figures, uh, the whole business with uh, you know uh, the, the anti-gay laws, and oh. in, in a sense, Putin. And I think he's been able to sort of, you know, rev up the PR machine to maybe make some inroads with the Russian people who might otherwise not feel this way. But uh, a lot of times he sees R Russia as sort of the anti-America. Uh, you will read uh, in the papers sometimes about, oh, how could you possibly let these people abuse children? In Russia, we don't do that, you know? 
Or uh, how could you let uh, same-sex marriages exist? It's not natural, you know? Uh, and, and so there, it's, it's like, you know, it's uh, like, uh, I don't know, Liberace and Mr. T, I don't know, these, these two, uh, <laughs> two guys going against each other, you know? Uh, and it shouldn't, it, it shouldn't have to be that way, uh, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, really. Spy versus spy, remember the black spy, the white spy? Okay. And my guess is that people are going to want to ask you all those questions. Mm -hmm. They want to know, well, how do you all perceive us in America? You know, I, I found that I, I got those questions all the time. But I would say particularly now, like, you know, what's, how do you Americans think about what's going on over here? They'll want to know. Well, some of us last, some of us, some of us last summer went to Moldova with the object of beginning several Friendship Force clubs, both in um, the capital city and in another smaller city that was on the border with Romania. And uh, we had some very interesting conversations with our home hosts. And you're right, they want to know more about us than we really know about them. And it was a great eye-opener for us. We have so much more in common than we do that's really different. And you'll probably find surprise that they know a lot more about us than we do about them. <laughs> I read an article about a woman who had every one of Andy Williams' albums. <laughs> you know? and, and for me, you know, culture, I've, I've always pushed the idea, you know, show each other's films, uh, you know, have each other's music available even TV shows, you know, anything that you can do to sort of uh, uh, undemonize the other. I, I think it's very important, and uh, I, um, I, I don't know what's going to happen with that. Uh, there's a version of, uh, was, there's this uh, Married with Children. Apparently there's a television show on now in Russia, which is a straight ripoff of Married with Children, uh, <laughs> scripts and all, so I'm told. Uh, it certainly looks like it, but uh, I don't know. I, I think, you know, when you talk to Russians, you just have to remember that... Uh, you know, you don't, you don't necessarily want to be confrontational. And, you know, it's sort of like pretend you're talking to your, uh, your crabby old aunt and then be surprised when it turns out that uh, he or she is very nice and uh, accepting and curious. Um, I, don't, I don't know if Russians are starting to get scared again about associating with foreigners. I know at one point, you know, you were not supposed to associate with foreigners. And, uh, you know, I remember talking too loudly in a restaurant once. And, shh, shh, shh. Mm -hmm. Um, but that was back in the old days, but I'm not sure, you know, it, it, it seems like if, if Putin wants control over people's lives, their hearts and minds, then I don't know how safe Russians feel about being able to express mm -hmm. themselves freely. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we'll see if we You'll get tell. You'll, <laughs> yeah, well. But go, go. Russia is a phenomenal place, fascinating country. Go with an open mind. Uh, and uh, look and listen and uh, have a good time. Yeah. Looking and listening might be better than speaking, huh? Mm -hmm. Sometimes. <laughs> Silence is golden. Silence is golden. <laughs> Any other questions before I ask our guests to stay and have Russian tea or water as they choose and a little refreshment with us and some more informal, perhaps one-on-one -on -one questions? Anything else from the floor? Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. Thank you.